Hello, everybody. Happy Friday to you all. And uh, go Dodgers tonight. All right, so today we are going to talk about generation of diversity and antibodies. And uh, we're not going to finish the rest of chapter four today. We will finish on Monday a few of the items that we don't have time for today. Um, and I don't really have anything prepared for, for a break because we have a lot to cover, but I will have a movie uh, that will describe all I'm gonna tell you over the first three pages of, of the notes. Um, this movie is from a different textbook, but it uses the same figures. And so I'd like to kind of hold off on the questions until we get through the first three pages of the notes and do the movie. Then we can go back and see if anything's not clear. So I've told you that any substance can elicit an antibody response. Doesn't matter whether it's you know, a pathogen or some synthetic protein or it can be a protein from mouse or human. Anything that the, that particular organism sees as foreign can elicit an antibody response. And the way this works is that you have this huge repertoire of B cells, each with its own unique antigen receptor. And it's been estimated that you have more than a billion or you know, maybe 10 or 100 billion different B cell clones at any one time capable of producing different antibodies. So the question is how you generate this kind of diversity. And it's not that we have 10 billion different genes, obviously. Uh, we know we have a finite number of genes, more like 25,000 or so in our genome. So what we're gonna talk about today is the process of gene rearrangement that leads to assortment uh, and, and generation of antibody genes. And it occurs because there's a limited number of gene segments that recombine uh, randomly to generate this repertoire, as we call it. Before I get into the figures, I want to make some definitions because I think people get confused with some of these terms. And I myself might even use one incorrectly. And if you see that, you can raise your hand or interrupt me and say, I think you used the wrong term here. It's easy to get confused. So let's go through it. Protein. This is a functional unit uh, that has a fun so something that, produce that does something in a cell. But it can be more than one polypeptide. For example, an antibody is a protein, but it has two heavy chains and two light chains. So what's a chain? For the purpose of this course, it's one polypeptide within a protein, for example, a heavy chain. A domain is a part of a polypeptide chain that folds into a structural uh, unit or separable structural area, like an Ig domain. We saw a picture of an antibody in three dimensions with the different uh, Ig-like domains, kind of like a beads on a string. So it, it's, a, it's a region within the, the chain of the polypeptide that folds together into some recognizable three-dimensional structure. A region is something that we use in this course in, in des describing antibodies that is a, a part of the entire protein. It's in areas of the Ig molecule or the T cell receptor that are constant or variable. So the variable region of antibodies includes the variable domain of the heavy chain and the light chain. Together we call that a region. The constant region consists of constant domains of the heavy chain and the, and the light chain, the constant region. An exon, you should understand from molecular biology, is a region of the genomic DNA that contains the protein coding information or untranslated regions of the mRNA, but it's something that's transcribed. And a gene segment is something that you wouldn't really hear about in other courses, but we'll define it for this course as, as, a, as a piece of a gene that's used for the process of VDJ rearrangement, which will be the subject of this lecture. So in order to understand this, all these processes I'm going to talk about today and next week, you really have to be solid in your molecular biology. You have to understand uh, exons and introns, mRNA splicing, DNA recombination. So uh, if you just barely squeaked by in molecular biology, you're going to have to go back and study because these things have to really be, you have to really understand them and put them together. It is very complicated. So uh, please um, keep that in mind as we go along. And this is a preview to all the different ways that that contribute to antibody diversity generation in the variable regions, there are four main processes. One is that multiple copies of the different variable region gene segments recombine. The second is that during the recombination process, there's junctional diversity, and we'll see what that means later on. There's the joining that occurs is imprecise. You get some addition and subtraction of nucleotides. The third generation of diversity is that you get pairing of different heavy and light chain uh, variable regions that can occur. 
And lastly, a process we'll talk about on Monday, somatic hypermutation. So this is just a preview and we'll go through each of these individually, starting with the first one, which is VDJ rearrangement. And I should just say at the outset that what you're going to learn today about VDJ rearrangement for antibodies, immunoglobulin genes, really applies similarly to the T cell receptor genes uh, that we'll see about in, in lecture eight. But we'll go pretty quickly through the T cell receptor rearrangement because, again, the concepts we've, have all been introduced here. So the variable, uh, the variable regions of the heavy and light chains are encoded by different gene segments that join together during uh, this DNA recombination process shown in figure 416. But what this shows here in this figure is the unrearranged Ig locus. Or, so each individual locus for the lambda light chain or the kappa light chain or the heavy chain locus are shown here. The plural of locus is L-O-C-I, and that's pronounced loci. People want to say loci, it's loci. So shown here, they're in what's called the germline configuration. This is the configuration you find in sperm and egg cells and in every other cell in your body except for uh, B cells that have changed this arrangement. So this is the germline configuration. And what it shows you is that there are two different gene segments for the light chain and three for the heavy chain. And they're named V and J for the light chain and then V and D and J for the heavy chain. And again, as we go through this lecture and you look back at your antibody structure lecture from Wednesday, you have to think about how that protein is put together at the DNA and the RNA level. And there'll be slides on today's lecture that kind of put that together for you. So the nomenclature for this particular slide, when you see a capital V, that refers to um, the segment that makes up most of the variable region sequence. If you remember the, sorry, variable domain sequence. The domains have about 110 amino acids. Of the 110 amino acids of the variable domain, about 100, let's say 95 to 100 or so, is encoded by the segment known as the V segment. And there's many different uh, V segments that you can use for the lambda, about 30. There's about 35 of them for kappa and about 40 of them for the heavy chain. And each one of them is preceded by its own short sequence known as a leader sequence. And if you remember from basic cell biology, for any protein that's, trans, uh, that's secreted or expressed on the cell surface, it has to be inserted into the ER membrane and it uses a small hydrophobic leader sequence and that's what the L refers to here. Most of the variable domain of the light chain and the heavy chain is encoded by the V segment, but the last few amino acids are encoded by these other segments. So for uh, both heavy and light chains, you have J segments shown here uh, and there are there's about four of them for the light chain, five of them for the kappa chain, and the, the lambda chain four, five for kappa, and six for heavy. The numbers here are not important. Just remember that there are several of them. And lastly, for the heavy chain, you have an additional D segment, which stands for diversity. And J is considered for joining. That's how they got their names. V for variable, J for joining, and D for diversity. But those are just terms. In the final exon for the variable domain of that light chain or heavy chain, you get uh, these, this arrangement that puts a, a V segment next to a J segment, or in the case of a heavy chain, V, D, and J together. And the last thing about nomenclature is you'll notice that the, each of the segments that it's numbered has a little subscript of a, uh, either a, a Greek symbol, lambda or kappa, or the capital H indicating the heavy chain. So the second variable a V segment in the heavy chain locus would be called VH2. The third variable a V segment in the kappa chain locus would be V kappa 3. So that's how we talk about them. And then if you look at the constant regions, which we're not going to talk about much today, we'll talk about more on Monday, they have the similar type of nomenclature, C kappa. Uh, there's just one of them. There's a couple different C lambdas. And there's uh, the different CH exons. So again, there are multiple copies of these. How many of them are there? This is just a table that illustrates uh, the, the numbers. Again, I'm not going to ask you to remember these numbers, but it just is to show that there's a lot of gene segments for uh, heavy chain and the two light chains. Uh, and there's a number of D segments for heavy chains and a number of different joining segments as well. <coughs> 
So this is where, oh, I should just say one more thing is, which is important for later on. Uh, all of these loci are on different chromosomes. And they're organized slightly differently. You'll notice some differences between the lambda light chain and the kappa light chain. Uh, don't memorize these differences or the numbers, but do remember that they're on different chromosomes because that will be important uh, for some of the discussion later on today and when we talk about B cell development in later lectures. So now it will start to make sense as you, as you look at what really happens when you get recombination occurring. On the left is shown light chain rearrangement and recombination, and on the right is shown heavy chain. Sometimes we'll refer to this as rearrangement, which is the general process of putting these segments together. The specific DNA process that does the, uh, that, that, that in, which produces this rearrangement is known as recombination. And it's called somatic recombination because it's occurring in a somatic cell, not in a germ cell, as you've learned about for meiosis, for example. So there's one recombination event for the light chain. It doesn't show all the V segments or all the J segments. It's just showing one of each. But these are plucked at random from all the different possibilities. And the V and the J segment are joined together by this recombination process. In the case of the heavy chain, you have two rearrangement events. The first that occurs is one D segment and one J segment are chosen to recombine together. And then the recombined DJ segment uh, is joined with one of the V segments and its upstream leader sequence. This is the final exon that will encode the variable domain of the heavy chain, and this is the exon that will encode the variable domain of the light chain. And once again, the process of choosing which of the V, D, and J segments uh, are recombined is random and differs from one B cell to the next. So that randomness and the multiple uh, copies that you can use results in, in, in one level of diversity for making antibodies. Another thing I want to point out from this figure is that the gene segments are separated by large areas or great distances in the genome. And that's represented by these little dots in the lines between the V and J segments uh, and between the D and J segments and D and V segments in the heavy chain. And uh, what that means is that you can, that th this process was first identified using looking at the structure of DNA and the sizes of DNA fragments and that they, they change in B cells in ways that you don't see in other cells in the animal or the human. And for that recognition that DNA rearranges and recombines and the sizes of DNA fragments uh, changes, uh, a Nobel Prize was awarded to Susumu Tonegawa in uh, the late 1980s. Now we know a lot more about this process since then, but the fundamental observation was that compared to the germline configuration you see in all other cells, in B cells, a lot of this intervening DNA has been removed. And this particular structures of the DNA in, this, in these loci differs from one B cell to the next. And so that gave the first insight into how you might generate a diverse antibody repertoire by this random recombination of DNA sequences. The next thing I want to point out about this figure is that the rest of the molecule is not joined together by DNA recombination, but by RNA splicing. So you make an mRNA from this product or from this product, and then these introns are removed by mRNA splicing. So now I'm going to jump to a figure that's at the end of the chapter, because I think it's important to introduce here. because it nicely shows you the antibody protein structures on the bottom. The light chain colored in on the left side, the heavy chain colored in on the right. So we're integrating the two lectures now, the one on antibody structure with the one on gene rearrangement. So you can see on the antibody uh, where the corresponding regions of the genome are represented. So let's start in the top. Here's the germline configuration. They're only showing one V and J segment, one V, D, and J, but remember there are many, many of these. The first thing that happens for the heavy chain is a D and a J join together. And then you get V to DJ joining. In the light chain, there's just one event, V to J. So this is the rearranged DNA. And it's different in every developing B cell. Then you get transcription, the primary RNA transcript. And then you get splicing. So the intron 
intron is removed between the leader and the VJ, between the J and the C uh, here, same over here, and even the introns between the constant region um, exons are spliced out. Now you get the messenger RNA, and this is what's translated into protein. And uh, then you get the, the leader sequence allows it to be inserted into membranes, so it comes to the surface or is secreted and is glycosylated during that process of export, which isn't shown here. But it makes it clear that if you just, let's say in the heavy chain, you look at the constant region, um, constant domains of the heavy chain. Each of them corresponds to different exons in the germline DNA that are uh, transcribed and then spliced together. But if you look at the variable domain of the heavy chain, it is formed by segments, three different segments, much of it from the V. Remember I told you most of the variable domain is encoded by a V segment, but some of it from the D and the J. It's not precisely in this configuration in three dimensions. It's just to show you that, that the heavy chain uh, variable domain consists of DNA that comes from th three different gene segments uh, in the germline. So again, keep in mind how the protein corresponds to the different gene segments and to different exons. Again, we'll, I'll come back for questions later on, but I want to get to the movie and then we can come back and answer any questions that you might have. So the next topic I want to talk about is, is how this all happens, this crazy, um, fantastic process of DNA rearrangement, the mechanism. Every single V segment, J segment, and D segment is flanked by what's known as a recombination signal sequence, or RSS. And these numbers, 7 and 9, uh, forget about the 23 and 12 for now. The 7 and 9 that are accompanied by colors, orange for 7 and purple for 9, are known as the heptamer nonomer sequence. Heptamer meaning 7, nonomer meaning 9. And for every V segment, and J segment and D segment, the nucleotide sequence of the heptamer is identical. We're not going to talk about what that sequence is, but it's the same seven nucleotides. And every, every nonomer, every nine nucleotide sequence, wherever it is uh, flanking one of these segments, is always the same nine nucleotides. Now these are, are not transcribed and translated. They're eventually lost during recombination. But these are signal sequences that are used to identify V segments, J segments, and D segments uh, for the recombination processes. Now, the second thing about the heptamer nonomer is that they're always separated by a distance of either 12 nucleotides or 23 nucleotides, and that's shown in white here. The sequence of those nucleotides is not conserved. It's the number that's conserved. Why 12 and 23? Well, these represent one helical turn of the DNA, which is usually about 11 and a half nucleotides, if you remember from molecular biology, and two turns of the DNA. What that means is that the, the heptamer and anonymer are facing in the same direction uh, on the DNA double helix. And that is essential for them to be recognized by the recombination machinery. Okay, so. VDJ recombination occurs on genes of the same chromosome, and it occurs in an ordered process. First the heavy chains rearrange, and then the light chains rearrange, and they, you start with either kappa or lambda. We'll learn about the details of that in the B-cell development lecture. But one reason that this always happens in this way is because of a rule known as the 12-23 the, uh, rule, rule. What that means is that when, you, when a, a V segment is, jo is chosen to join with a J segment, you only get uh, recombination if one of them has an RSS with a 23 base pair spacer and the other has an RSS with a 12 base pair spacer. So for example, if a V lambda wanted to rearrange to a J kappa, that would violate the 1223 rule because both have RSS with 23 base pair spacers. A V lambda can only rearrange to a J lambda because all the J lambda segments have 12 base pair RSS spacers. One other thing I, I should have mentioned is that for the V segments, whether it's V lambda, kappa, or the heavy chain V segments, 
the RSS sequence is always three prime or downstream of the variable segment, B segment. For the J segments, it's always upstream or five prime. And for D segments, there's one up, upstream five prime and one three prime. So all J segments have an RSS on each side. Uh, for J segments, the RSS is five prime. For V segments, it's three prime. And this also explains partly why in the, in the heavy chain you get first rearrangement of, of the D segment to the J segment because that satisfies the 1223 rule. And then now you can have uh, V to D, again 1223. You would never skip directly from V to J because they both have 23 base pair spacers. So the 1223 rule ensures that you go D to J and then V to D and ensures that you don't have V segments from one light chain locus rearranging to J segments at another. Now this process only occurs in B cells and in T cells. And T cells use different V and J segments to make T cell receptor alpha and beta chains. Uh, but the, the same proteins involved in recognizing these RSS sequence are expressed in B and T cells. And before I discuss what these proteins are, I just want to define for you two types of enzymes that cut DNA. One is an endonuclease and one's an exonuclease. Endonucleases can cleave intact, double-stranded DNA. Exonucleases just chew away nucleotides from the ends. And the, the, the protein complex that's involved in this recombination has both types of enzyme. This protein complex is known as the VDJ recombinase. And it's composed of several enzymes that act together to carry out this reaction. And it's part of it shown here in figure 420. The most important ones and the ones you need to remember are the proteins known as RAG proteins. And there are two of them, RAG1 and RAG2. In this figure, they just show uh, RAG, which is a complex of one RAG2, RAG1 subunit and one RAG2 subunit. RAG stands for recombination activating gene. And it's the RAG proteins that directly bind to and recognize the RSS sequence, the heptamer, spacer, nonmer sequences. One RAG1,2 dimer binds to one of the RSS sequence and another will bind to the other one. And that brings the two together and the RAG uh, proteins are, are actually endonucleases which cleave the DNA right at the border here of the V and J segments. So you can see the heptamer is coming along with this part and then the, the V and J segments are ready to be joined together by other proteins which there are many of them, but they're shown here as one long blue protein. It's really a complex of many other proteins. Let me say something else about the RAG proteins. These are only expressed during development of T cells in the thymus, so in thymocytes, or in B cells developing in the bone marrow, the pro-B cells and pre-B cells we'll learn about in the B cell development lecture. RAG1 and RAG2 are not expressed in any other cells, and that is why the Ig locus or loci remain in germline configuration in every other cell type. Only in developing T cells and B cells do you have these proteins expressed that can bind to, recognize RSS sequences, and initiate the cleavage process. The second thing I want to say is that um, it would make sense it's logical or intuitive to think that RAG1 recognizes a 12, a 12 base pair spacer, let's say, and RAG2 recognizes a 23 base pair spacer. But that is not what happens. It's been shown that, uh, and it's not understood why this happens, but if you look at a 12 base pair RSS, there's a dimer of RAG1 and RAG2 here, and the 12, 23 base pair spacer RSS, there's another dimer of RAG1 and RAG2 there. So we still don't know the molecular reason for the 1223 rule. Each one is bound by a RAG1, RAG2 dimer. So RAG1 and RAG2 are only in, in developing lymphocytes, but the rest of the DNA repair proteins are found in all cells. Anytime you get a double strand break, these proteins are around, whether it occurs because RAG cleavage or because of UV damage or whatever it is, these proteins are ready to kick into action. And the one that I want you to remember is known as DNA-PK, DNA-dependent protein kinase, uh, because this is 
relatively common uh, human disease gene. Mutations in DNA-PK are the cause, uh, are one of the causes of severe combined immunodeficiency, or SCID. And these patients will die if they're not given bone marrow transplants and, and kept in sterile conditions until they can be treated. But there are several other enzymes involved in DNA repair that are part of this general recombination machinery. Okay, so again, RAG1, RAG2 dimers recognize the RSS sequences, come together, cleave the DNA, and then the DNA is joined again together by ubiquitously expressed DNA repair proteins, including DNA-PK. And what you're left with is two rejoined DNA uh, sequences. The one that has the V and the J segment that's used to make the antibody is known as the coding joint, and the rest of the DNA that's removed during the recombination process is known as the signal joint. And eventually, because this is no longer part of the chromosome, it's not replicated and it's lost from the cells over time. Okay, so the last part I want to talk about before we get to the movie is the specifics of, the, of what happens during the repair of the coding joint, because this is not precise. And this leads to the second level of diversity generation known as junctional diversity. Now, I want to go back to the last lecture and remind you that if you look at the protein structure and you sequence a number of different uh, variable domains, this is a light chain variable, it should say domain, not region, um, you, you notice that there are hypervariable loops known as the CDR1, 2, and 3. And there's some variability in the framework regions, but it's not as much. From what I told you today, you'll remember that the V segment encodes about 90 to 9,500 nucleotides, of, and the rest is encoded by the D or the J segment for the light chain or the D and J segments for the heavy chain. So the entire CDR1 and 2, the first two hypervariable loops, are always provided by the V segments. The CDR3 is encoded by the junction of the V and J segment, part of the J segment, and if it's a heavy chain, the D segment and its junctions with a, the V and J segments. So just again, looking at the CDR1 and 2, the reason these are variable is because V segments have duplicated and diverged over the years, and the divergence has accumulated most uh, profoundly in the, these loops. There's been less divergence in the framework regions because if you have a lot of different, any, any nucleotide or any amino acid that disrupts the beta sheet structure, then it would not be functional. But you can get a lot of divergence in the loops here because they're not part of the, the structural core of the protein. So over time, you have 20, 30, 40 gene segments for heavy and light chains. And the most, of, most changes have occurred in these loops uh, that turn out to be the CDR loops. But still, there's a finite number of V segments. There's 20 or 30, as I told you. But there's a huge number of different possibilities of joining V and J segments, or V and D and J segments. So that's why the CDR3 loops are, are even more diverse, because they are encoded by the joining together of these segments. And second, because the process of joining them together is imprecise. And that's shown in figure 421. There's a lot of detail in here that uh, you can study if you're interested. But for the purposes of our, um, our class, I just want to point out that the cleavage occurs right at the border of the heptamer and either the D segment or the J segment, or it could be the V segment. And then what you get at the end is a bunch of nucleotides that were not found in the original DNA sequence. And sometimes you lose nucleotides, sometimes you add nucleotides. There's a number of processes, exonucleases, polymerases, that act during the joining process that change the nucleotide sequence. They can remove some nucleotides from the D segment or the J segment. They can add some nucleotides. Uh, it's a fascinating process, and it's essential for producing the huge amount of diversity you get in the CDR3 loop. Um, don't have to know the difference between P nucleotides and N nucleotides. Uh, for the purposes of this course, I just want you to understand that 
during the joining process, a number of enzymes get involved that, that change the DNA sequence at the site of joining, at the coding joint. So even though it looks like v, this V segment and J segment were joined precisely together, it may have lost some nucleotides from either one and may have added some new ones uh, that weren't found in the genome originally. And that also contributes to the large variability in the CDR3 loop. So let me show the movie and then oops, we'll come back and answer questions. Segments of DNA oops. that become joint immunoglobulin genes are composed of separated segments of DNA that become joined together by a process called somatic recombination to make a functional gene. In heavy chain genes, there are three gene segments, the variable, or V segment, a diversity, or D gene segment, and the joining, or J segment. Light chain genes, such as those shown here, have only two gene segments, the V and the J segments. Gene segments that can be recombined have specific sequence motifs adjacent to them, called recombination signal sequence, or RSS motifs. A protein complex containing the products of the recombination activator genes, RAD1 and RAD2, binds specifically to the RSS motifs. In this example, flanking a V gene segment and a J gene segment. The individual gene segments to whose flanking RSS motifs the RAD protein complexes bind are selected at random from a number of copies present at each gene locus. The RAD protein complexes bring together the gene segments to be recombined and cleave the DNA exactly at the junction of the gene segment and its adjoining RSS motif. The cleavage creates a hairpin of DNA. So um, the hairpin part we can ignore. It's, uh, it has to do with the generation of p-nucleotides, but let's just ignore that. ...of DNA at the end of the gene segments and double-stranded breaks at the ends of the RSS motifs. Additional proteins... DNA-dependent protein kinase, Ku, Artemis, and a dimer of DNA ligase and XRCC4 are incorporated into a large complex with the RAD proteins. These RSS ends are joined, forming what is called the signal joint to create a closed circle of DNA that plays no further role in the recombination process. The DNA hairpins at the ends of the gene segments are then cleaved. An additional enzyme, Terminal deoxynucleotidal transferase, or TDT, is recruited and adds additional nucleotides to the ends of the DNA strands. The other enzymes in the complex ligate together the two ends of the gene segments, completing the recombination process. So the textbook that we use doesn't have the information uh, or, or these videos. It does talk about TDT and end nucleotides and hairpins. Uh, just in my experience, the, these issues create so much trouble for understanding at this level that I've just decided to, I'm not going to test you on them. If you're interested in them, you can go ahead and read about it. Be happy to answer questions outside of class time. But the key point that I just want you to understand is that the final product can, can contain some nucleotides that weren't there to begin with and could have lost some nucleotides from the ends of this, the, the, uh, the gene segments. Okay, so now I'm open for questions from anything we've talked about so far in today's lecture. Yes? Um, during mRNA splicing for the heavy chain, um, is that responsible for like, the different isotypes found? I mean, like mRNA splicing is, not, uh, is, is responsible for IgM and IgD, which I'll talk about in a minute, but the other isotypes is are generated through a different recombination process that occurs called uh, class switch recombination. We'll talk about it on Monday. Yeah. When does the recombination event occur in the cell cycle? When does it occur in the cell cycle? I don't know, but I, it's probably in G1 phase. And you know, I think it occurs in cells that are not dividing. So there are stages during thymocyte development and early B cell development where cells divide, and there are stages where they're not dividing. And it's, it's in those G0 or, or G1 phases when the recombination occurs. And you have to repair the DNA before they can replicate it. So the change is permanent. Yeah, the change is permanent. All the daughter cells will have that change. Yes? 
So the question is about the leader sequence. Um, for any protein to, to be a receptor that has its transmembrane or to be secreted, it has to be uh, inserted into the endoplasmic reticulum during the translation process. And uh, fundamental cell biology, that if you've taken D103 or probably even in your, in your early you know, bio 93 or 94 course, would, you know, tells you about these leader sequences. Any, pro, any protein that's destined to be secreted or transmembrane has a leader sequence. Uh, and because antibody genes are unusual, there can be you know, 20 or 30 different V segments. And they're chosen at random. Each one of them has to have its own leader peptide, uh, leader exon, that encodes one of these hydrophobic sequences that allows the signal recognition particle to insert it into the ER so that it can be secreted or transmembrane. So if you go back to this, you can see that each V segment, whether it's a heavy chain or kappa or lambda, has its own uh, L mini exon, so to speak. It's a different exon because there's a little bit of intron in between that's spliced out later on. You could imagine that there would be one leader exon that's transcribed uh, and then spliced, but the distances are so great in the genome that, uh, that, that it probably wouldn't work all that well. So each, X, each V segment has its own L segment or L mini exon that's used. It happens automatically for every individual before you've been exposed to a pathogen. So the, the goal is to produce a huge diverse repertoire so that some of them that you produce will be able to respond to any pathogen. So all this occurs in the bone marrow uh, before, be, before encountering pathogens. The class switching of antibodies occurs after pathogen recognition and, and, is, and is, is kind of um, skewed towards what you need to do to deal with that pathogen, which, effect, which FC portion, which effector function of antibody you need, whether it's complement activation or, and we'll see about that later on. But for, for the, this, everything we're talking about today has to do with generating the antigen binding site. And this is all a random process that generates a huge army of clones, so only a few of which will be useful for any one pathogen. Does that answer? Yeah. There was another question. Okay, so you really need to come back, keep coming back to this figure and make sure you truly understand at the protein level what the antibody looks like and where the different domains are encoded and how. Yeah. Can you go back to the slide that had the variability graph? Oh, yeah. So the one that has the most variability and it has the, the D and J combination, has all yeah. those uh, amino acids in the middle. So would that be considered the variable region as well? Or is that constant because of the recombination? Does that play any role in the variability? I'm not sure I understand. But um, so there are three hypervariable loops that form the antigen binding site. The first two, or CDR1 and 2, are encoded by the V segment for that particular B cell. Hypervariable loop 3, or CDR3, is encoded by parts of the V and J segment for the light chain and parts of the V, D, and J segment for the heavy chain, as well as those additional nucleotides that are added by TDT. So, those uh, additional nucleotides are different? They're random. They're so, different. Uh, yeah. So I guess we can talk about it since it's, it is maybe important. This enzyme, TDT, it adds nucleotides at random to the ends of this DNA breaks. Um, and again, this is a, a, a protein that's only expressed in developing T cells and B cells. And for some reason, it's targeted to these sites of, of recombination, and it will add nucleotides. There, there are other um, ex endonucleases or exonucleases that will remove some of these and might even chew away some of the ones that were in the, v, the D or J segments. But what you end up with is that the coding joint, the sequence of nucleotides, is not what you'd predict if you just put together the genomic sequences. And that leads me to an important point. Because this is process uh, random, uh, the, it's not just that 
the nature of those nucleotides, but the number of nucleotides that differs. That presents a problem. In order to keep the open reading frame, you can't have this sort of randomness. Uh, and so it turns out that two thirds of every recombination event will result in an out of frame protein. And that's known as a non functional rearrangement. So only one third of the, re, uh, because of this randomness, only one third of the recombination events will result in an exon that stays in frame that allows you to make an antibody heavy chain or light chain. And we'll deal with this problem in a later lecture. Okay. Okay, so there's a concept known as allelic exclusion, which explains why you only, every B cell has only one heavy chain and one light chain. And that's that um, once you have a successful rearrangement of one heavy chain, remember there's two chromosomes for each. If the first chromosome rearranges successfully and you make a, a functional protein, then the other allele is excluded from rearranging. So if you make a functional heavy chain, then you exclude the other allele, allelic exclusion, you only, so that only one heavy chain is produced. And once you make a functional light chain, all other rearrangement stops at other light chain loci, so you only make one light chain. And I just want to introduce that concept. We'll come back to it in the lectures on B cell development. But the, the outcome is it ensures that there's a single heavy chain, single light chain, and a single specificity for each B cell, antigen specificity. So now we'll come to quickly to the third source of diversity, which is really just a mathematical uh, exercise in adding up the different combinations that you can get in, in the uh, V and J segments. So how many different heavy chains can you generate and different light chains? If you just do some math, multiply the number of V and J segments for kappa and add them to the number of V and J segments for lambda, you come up with, this is in your notes and it's just for your interest, the numbers you don't need to memorize. About 300 possible light chains. And if you do the math for the heavy chain, you come up with about 5,500 possible heavy chains. And because each B cell could theoretically have any of those heavy chains, and any of these light chains, you multiply those, num um, those numbers together and you get about 1.6 million different antibody specificities. And that is known as combinatorial diversity combining different V and J segments, V, D, and J segments, and different heavy and light chains together without any junctional diversity at all gives you over a million different possible antibody combinations. But because of the junctional diversity, you now jump by about uh, a thousand times to about a billion different possible sequences. And that additional diversity is all in the CDR3 loop, not in CDR1 and 2. There's a, a fourth mechanism of diversity, which we'll talk about on Monday, which is known as somatic harpy mutation, and that bumps you up from a billion different uh, potential sequences to something like 100 billion or 10 to the 11th different antibodies that you could potentially have in your repertoire. Okay, so let's look at the heavy chain locus again. And now this is an example of a mature B cell where you've had a successful VDJ rearrangement event. It has its leader at mini exon. And you can see if you look at the locus, each of these uh, boxes represents a set of exons encoding the different isotypes. So mu would be IgM, delta would be IgD, et cetera. And at, when a B cell first completes VDJ recombination, it will make a heavy chain uh, that from a transcript that starts up here ahead of the leader sequence and ends downstream of the delta exons. There's a transcriptional stop that occurs here. So the initial transcripts span this entire region. Later on through the, the different process, you might use these exons down here, but let's deal with that on Monday. And because you make one long RNA shown here, Here's the leader, VDJ, the mu exons, the delta exons. 
you can use alternative RNA processing to produce either IgM protein or IgD protein. At the earliest stages of, of when a B cell leaves the bone marrow, it's, it has only IgM on the surface. But later on, the naive B cells, before they've encountered antigen, you'll find that they express both IgD and IgM on the surface. And that's because the same primary RNA transcript can be processed or spliced differently to encode either IgM or IgD, illustrated by the blue and the purple exons here. And the, uh, you know, the details are a little complicated, but I just want you to know the general idea that you have one long RNA transcript, primary transcript, that can be spliced differently and polyadenylated to produce an mRNA encoding either the IgM protein or the IgD protein. Now, why is this important? It turns out that there are IgM and IgD exons and mature B cells express IgM and IgD in all of the mammal, mammalian organisms that have been looked at and some other um, vertebrate animals as well. So there must be some important function of having two different isotypes on these resting B cells. It hasn't really been clear what that function might be though because in mouse genetic experiments where these exons were removed by um, gene targeting, the mice seem perfectly healthy. So the function of IgD isn't really clear right now. And if you remember from an early figure, uh, very little IgD is actually secreted um, and found in the plasma. So what its function isn't known, but you do notice, you may remember that the IgD looks a little like IgG in that it has a flexible hinge region and IgM doesn't. That also has one less Ig domain. So it's shorter and more flexible. And it may be that having both IgM and IgD on the surface of a resting B cell gives you a little bit more flexibility in the types of antigens that you can recognize. You have one that's shorter and more flexible, one that projects out a little farther but that's not flexible. Uh, but under the conditions of experiments with laboratory mice, there's been no obvious reason why you have to have both IgM and IgD. But it just makes our lives more complicated as immunology students and immunology professors because we have to talk about the fact that Ig that mu and delta exons are transcribed together and then differentially processed to produce the final mRNA that encodes IgM or IgD at the same time in the same cell. Okay, quickly I just want to mention that um, once a, the B cell receptor gets to the surface, and this, in this example it's IgM, it associates with two proteins that are, that are the same in all cells. They're not uh, different in each B cell, and they're known as Ig alpha and beta. And these have the two functions. One is to basically chaperone the Ig molecule to the surface of the cell. Without these proteins, the B cell receptor stays in the intracellular vesicles. And the second is that they have longer cytoplasmic tails that are involved in signaling when an antigen is bound. And then the last figure of today's lecture deals with the issue of, of how you can make both transmembrane IgEs and secreted IgEs. And in this example, they talk about IgM, but the same is true for all the other isotypes. Uh, and that, again, involves alternative RNA processing. On the surface of a resting B cell, you have transmembrane IgM. In a plasma cell, you're secreted IgM or some other isotype. And you'll notice after the initial cluster of exons that encode the, the antibody protein, there are these other exons uh, that are known as SC or MC. And this SC stands for secretion coding and MC stands for membrane coding. And again, through alternative processing, you can either choose the membrane coding exons, which allows you to have the transmembrane surface Ig, or in the plasma cells, they choose the secretion coding exons, uh, and that leads to the form that's secreted. Any questions about alternative RNA processing to produce IgM and IgD or to produce transmembrane or secreted? I, went, I skipped over some of the details here with these polyadenylation sites just to focus on the concept of alternative RNA processing.
It's different than DNA recombination that generates the VDJ exon. It has to do with how you use the different exons and the poly A sequences to generate the final M messenger RNA that produces the protein. So announcement before you go, I'm going to post the answers to the uh, first practice quiz today and I'll post a practice quiz for chapters three and four. It will include material from the first part of Monday's lecture which you can work on later on. And I was hoping to have time today to talk about this fax experiment but we've run out so I'll find another day to talk about it. <laughs>